my interest is from the point of view of social science. Um, language degradation is, for all intents and purposes, um, fairly technical. And it seems to me that, to a large extent, many of the persons working on this are forgetting or putting somehow on the side uh, the issue of the people. Um, for example, it, it says in the, um, in the declaration we are going to adopt that uh, com companies are going to uh, focus on land. And I'm thinking the land is used by somebody, the land is owned by somebody. Why are they not mentioned? Uh, and I do this from the point of view of social sciences. I'm an anthropologist and I've worked with people involved in development projects uh, for 30 years. Is that a wider problem with all environmental issues that people people are often regarded as being the problem um, and uh, solutions are often seen as being um, policies and treaties and, and other deals which perhaps don't uh, deal with the those individuals at the foot of the uh, foot of the pyramid well, it certainly used to be like that it's changing a bit the, the best example in this part of the world where we are now is when they started setting up national parks and decided that the reason for uh, why wildlife were, sh were killed were local people so they tried as best they could to uh, keep local people out and then hence you've got the dichotomy people versus parks but it's changing a lot. No, these days local people are actively involved in um, in um, managing resources, parks, uh, wildlife. So so it's moving in the right direction. But I think it's still, as some of the people in this uh, old meeting are, are, are expressing themselves, we still have some way to go. And how would you like to see? Um you know, people being recognised or the role of individuals recognised more either w within the text or, or within policies? Well, they should... Pe people, I mean, uh, by people I mean local people uh, which lives in a project area or that will be uh, the target of a uh, private uh, company's activities, they have to be taken seriously. They have to be on, uh, taken on their own terms which means that we, the outsiders, have to understand their culture and uh, speak to them from that point of view. Um, the key term in anthropology is cultural relativism. Uh, the fact that um, uh, people are different and should be uh, uh, recognized for being, being different. And the way to do it is to... Um, participation is the key term, involve people talk to people, recognize anybody that wants to be a stakeholder as such, uh, to have an interest in the activity and be uh, recognized for that and involved throughout the project cycle. I mean, you make it sound very simple, but what's, what's, what's then the issue in, in, in holding it back? Cause it's not just developing countries that have this problem, even developed countries, when they look at new developments, new schemes, new roads going through particular bits of um, land often disregard the views of, of, uh, of locals. So what's, what, what's the issue here? Is it just simply a case that people need to, to listen more or is there something, something deeper? No, we need to listen more. But basically we need to construct projects that people want. We cannot come with preconceived idea of what to do or what product to sell if it's in case of a company. Um, and that may sound like it easy, but it's of course terribly difficult and not the least it's extremely long drawn. Um, if you really go that way, it takes a lot of time. And I think that's, there's, there shouldn't be a problem with that. Um, there is of course from the point of view of private companies, for example, who um, who has a, has a profit um, uh, motive and uh, we're using a lot of time means that they, from that narrow point of view, actually you know, lose money. Mm -hmm. But um, in, a, in a sense, that is their problem. If they, if they come to a foreign country and a foreign culture, then they have to, we have to um, uh, follow the pace of life and uh, the way things run there, the, 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 the local cultural values and mores. Um, 
but in a sense that that kind of runs against the, the sort of current um, growth and development paradigm, doesn't it? The idea that you go to another country and accept the way they they develop it. it for, for many for many investors, it would be too slow. They need to go to places and and put their own footprint, don't they, on on how how they want things to to, to move. Exactly, and which is exactly why the issue of private sector and development uh, has some kind of built-in uh, controversies or contradictions to it. And um, I, as possibly the, the lone scientist of this, uh, social scientist, sorry, mm. at this meeting, uh, will try my best to point that out. Um, natural scientists and business managers have a tendency of making it too easy uh, and I hope to make it clear that it is far from easy and uh, that they to su- actually yeah okay from the point of view of the private sector if they this is the argument that many understand they want to do it short but at the same time they want to be successful hmm. so it, if I succeed in my argument it will be to say that if you want to succeed in your activities then you have to consider local people and make projects that are acceptable useful from their point of view and then you will succeed then you will also hopefully meet your own goal and you raised a point in one of the meetings this morning about public um, public public private partnerships mm. um, and that seems to be something that's becoming increasingly relevant particularly amongst um, in environmental circles, private finance is, it seems to be the only way of securing a channeling a flow of funds. Um, at least, if you listen to the leaders and finance leaders of developed um, countries who, who say they can't allocate enough public funds. So, is this is this an issue that we need to deal with and address? Um, we will need to address more frequently in in, in the coming years, as um, I guess the percentage the the capacity of the private sector to take on some of these environmental initiatives grows. Yeah, absolutely. What I did say this morning was uh, raise the question of um, a private company makes a deal with the government entity, and that's it from their point of view. They do not concern themselves with how the public sector agency uh, connects with the local people, the citizens. Um, which means that in many cases uh, the, pr- the companies wish and hope to reach the poor people will not even materialize. The, there are three sectors in society and so far nobody has mentioned the third one. There's public sector, there's private sector and there's civil society. Mm. And I, I read the draft um, declaration that we are going to adopt tomorrow, and there is no reference to civil society. There is no reference to people. There is no reference to stakeholders. Um, so we have a long way to go. And uh, I'm not, as it is, I'm not confident that uh, the public-private partnerships is, as it is, is a useful model to reach the poor. It was useful in a very limited sense, if you want to build a road or build a hospital. But no, these guys in the, the private sector want to really get down to the local level to um, sell their products, for example. And then um, and then PPP becomes limiting, I find. Mm. I mean, you're, you and your organization work in a, a number of different countries, Bangladesh, Bulgaria. Um, you said you've worked in Mauritania, Ghana. Um, Chad, West Africa. Um, are these are these um, are we facing the sort of similar challenges all, all, all across the world? Are the challenges the, the same? And are some countries? Um, do you see some countries involving um, local communities better than others? Some regions involving local communities better than others? There is a marked difference, and one that I was only made aware of. Um, three, four, five years ago when I started working in Eastern Europe, which I've never done before. Um, we now have two blocks of countries. We have developing countries and we have what is called transition countries. And there's a marked difference in the sense that um, the, in many 
developing countries in Africa, including in Africa, there are very strong and vocal NGOs. Civil society is very organized. Uh, and if nothing happened there, nothing happens in these countries, not because their lack of ability to express their views. In transition countries, there, there is, for all intents and purposes, hardly what we can call civil society. And so my problem working there is that I cannot knock on the door of the next uh, NGO and says, uh, what do you want here? How can I represent you? There, there, there is the government and there is a fledgling growing private sector, basically. And there are organizations that call themselves NGOs, but uh, are more aligned with the old uh, regime in a way, uh, with the old way of thinking, hierarchical organizations. So. But that's also changing. Um, in Eastern Europe, um, there's a strong focus on environment, and um, because the government don't have money, international organizations, WRI, IUCN, come in and bring in uh, their staff, um, young people who are trained in environmental issues, and uh, from that point, from that position, contribute to building um, the NGO local capacity. So it is changing fast there too. There's something that I would like to add, uh, not add, or focus on, um, CBNRM, mm -hmm. Community-Based Natural Resource Management, which started in this part of the world around mid-80s, had to do with um, wildlife management and has since spread to the rest of the world. When I worked for the World Bank, I was involved in training in CBNRM. Um, and I am now a coordinator for an NGO that works on community-based natural resource management based in Norway. It strikes me that um, CBNRM is an approach that could very well be connected with um, work on land management and, and climate change uh, in this country and the, or in this region, including in Namibia, where there is actually a strong CBNRM uh, group. Uh, yeah. And I guess a final point, I mean, in terms of your um, your own organisation, Suppress, and the work you guys do, what, what's your um, what, what's your key philosophy then when it comes to um, dealing with uh, development projects? Do you do you focus first on the people and then on the problem, or um, is is that sort of simplifying it a bit? Of course it is, but it's um, it all, you also point to an important conundrum in a way. I mean, the ideal is that I say that I start with the people. In reality, you have to, uh, that sounds impossible, but you, in a way you have to start with everybody. Um, um, you have to start with the public sector, with the private sector, and with the local people. And the issue is to get them to talk to each other. So not just private sector and public sector, as in PPP, but public sector and civil society, and civil society, and private sector. In a way, if you can uh, mentally picture a, a table, a round table, where everybody sits around and shares views and uh, manages to adopt uh, common agendas on how to proceed, I think that's, that's sort of my vision of uh, a good way to work.